this upcoming panel discussion, Clinical Trial Diversity, a Research Imperative, will be about what we have learned about creating diverse clinical trials and how do we make sure it's at the forefront of trial designs. Our moderator for the session is Yasmin Long, who is the director of Faster Cures within the Millikan Institute. And joining her on the panel are Dr. Moses Alabo, Programs Manager, Grand Challenges Africa with the Science for Africa Foundation. Dr. Melanie Iverson, Chief Development Officer at Moderna. Dr. Al Reese, who is Dean Emeritus and former Executive Vice President and Professor of OBGYN and Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Maryland. And I might also add a longtime uh, Research America board member. So all of our speakers' bios can be found in the toolbar at the bottom of the virtual environment page. And with that, Yasmin, I'm delighted to turn the program over to you. Great, thank you, Mike. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Yasmin Long, Director at Faster Cures, which is the center of the Milken Institute, as Mike mentioned. I lead Faster Cures work in health equity and diversity in clinical trials. So I am thrilled to be moderating this discussion at the National Health Research Forum about clinical trial diversity, a research imperative. The lack of diversity in clinical trials has been an issue in research for years, and, and this is a time for a call to action in order to achieve health equity in clinical trial diversity and across the biomedical research ecosystem using a multi-stakeholder approach. So I welcome the panelists and, and thank you all for joining us today in the audience. Please inform um, the audience a bit more about your work, panelists, as I introduce the questions to you. So now let's dive right into the discussion. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Uh, Lobo. Um, what are the current priorities and research capacity building in Africa where you're based uh, within your organization? And what are the barriers that are unique to that area or region? Thanks again, uh, Dr. Long, for that introduction. And also for the introduction to you know, this particular panel, as well as uh, I feel very honored to be here uh, for this discussion. So I am seated in Nairobi, Kenya at the moment, and uh, happy to give a perspective of what we think should actually be done for clinical trials to improve clinical trial diversity for the world of global health to move um, you know, ahead faster. So I'm sure you all know that uh, um, we need to care because just about 2% of global trials are currently being done in Africa. And yet, of course, we know, for example, that the African pan genome uh, has got 10% more DNA than the current human reference genome, and with more vari variation, actually, more than any other continent. And yet, at the same time, we keep developing drugs. So, for example, efavirenz has been shown to clearly have uh, neuropsychiatric adverse events uh, more pronounced on the African continent, for example. And yet again, during COVID-19, it was quite uh, clear that uh, there was some form of cross-protection from uh, local circulating coronaviruses and other retroviruses that uh, probably uh, gave some bit of protection to uh, you know, the, the population. So therefore, there is quite a lot that we need to do. And I think uh, improving our, uh, our diversity will be absolutely important. So uh, just some... Um, top line issues that I'd like to mention. The first one, which I think is also a global affair is that uh, clinical trials uh, that have no impact at all uh, are increasingly being done all around the world. And we think that this prominently so on the African continent because you find that the clinical trials are small, they're poorly funded. And sometimes the restriction is actually down to just uh, either a low budget or uh, having poor clinical trial design. Uh, so therefore, we need to be at a place where we can be able to quickly ramp up clinical trials and uh, you know, have them big, large, and built for impact. And then, of course, there is the lack of participation in clinical trial protocol building from areas in which these particular clinical trials are actually going to be done. Uh, so we think and believe that for the success of clinical trials in the future, we need to reach a point where uh, there is participation of investigators uh, who are from those particular regions to actually, uh, you know, give <clears throat> their thoughts on the clinical trial uh, protocol. 
And then there's the issue of proprietary holding of clinical trial quality assessment tools by sponsors to the extent that it's now down to a clinical trial center to actually build their own, um, as it were, uh, a continuum or continued view of what the world actually needs in terms of uh, uh, clinical trial uh, quality assessments. So it will be important if we get to a point where uh, you know, groups, sponsors are at a place where they can actually open up and say, you know what, uh, we will give you the assessment tools uh, so that you can use it for capacity building. And then of course, there's the issue of regulatory uh, authorities and even ethics review committees, um, you know, uh, not having an independent uh, broker as it were, who can be able to assist them build their research capacity. Uh, so on this particular aspect, for example, Science for Africa Foundation, uh, one of our groups, the clinical trial community is one of those that, uh, you know, we go out and try and build research capacity within uh, ethics, uh, you know, ethics and regulatory authorities uh, on behalf of groups that are doing clinical trial research um, on the continent. And then um, there are some uh, legacy trust issues, which uh, I'll just, uh, you know, quickly touch on. Uh, electronic data capture is definitely great. And uh, it has moved us quite a bit in terms of having centralized data centers and related processes. But uh, it's interesting to just mention that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes there's a lack of technology transfer to manage some of these clinical trial databases and data centers. So therefore, uh, some of the African uh, low and middle income countries are actually lagging behind in terms of developing their own capacity to manage databases and data sciences. So I think that's uh, sort of like my opening remarks, uh, Yasmin, and I'll um, give it back to you. Sure, thank you for that. And it sounds like there are uh, many challenges with um, sort of health systems and, and health system strengthening in, in that regard. So we'll, we'll come back to that um, momentarily. I, I, I do wanna turn to you now, Dr. Iverson. Um, how did the urgency of the COVID-19 pandemic shape clinical trial design and execution and research and development? Thank you, Dr. Long, uh, for first the invitation to speak today and um, for uh, the opportunity to meet with the esteemed panel. The um, COVID-19 pandemic obviously presented all the vaccine manufacturers with an unprecedented challenge. We needed to develop safe and effective vaccines as quickly as possible, um, not cutting any corners around collecting the appropriate data so that everybody knew that they had been tested appropriately. We, as our protocols were being developed, we were also starting to understand the impact of COVID-19 on um, different populations and the disproportionate impact on um, people of color. And therefore, as we have um, developed our uh, vaccine for um, the Moderna vaccine, that trial was conducted entirely in the US. I would like to remind everybody that Moderna had never conducted a phase three clinical trial until the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and in that short period of time for startup, we did not have the infrastructure to make that a global trial. But what we were very determined to do was to make that trial representative of the US population and those being most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 um, infection. So we started to build that into the very beginning of our design. So from the very beginning of the phase three, identifying sites that will have the ability to recruit people from diverse populations, ensuring that the literature we provided, the consent form uh, was completely appropriate and that we were reaching out into the community to make sure that people were informed. All we wanted was to make sure that they could make an informed decision whether to participate um, and that they could obtain the information they needed to make an informed decision. That was incredibly important to us. And we worked with community leaders, with our clinical trial sites to make sure that that happened. And wherever possible, took that trial out into the community by creating satellite hubs um, out into community areas where those who were interested to learn more and would be interested to participate were able to find a, a center and participate locally to them. 
I have to say all of this had to take place in a matter of weeks. And if I tell you that the majority of vaccines studied uh, up until that point had consisted of over 90% Caucasian participants, um, it was indeed a major challenge to uh, build that infrastructure um, as quickly as we needed to do just in a matter of weeks. So in, in thinking about that and, and standing up sites and, and expanding that sort of infrastructure to increase diversity in, in clinical trials, uh, what role or how vital would you say health literacy is when recruiting for clinical trials and how can researchers help improve literacy to increase yeah. research participation? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. And that's something we didn't get right from the very beginning. Our literature, the imagery we used, the way our documents were written, had been written in a very generic way. Um, and it, we, we had to stop and think and quickly pivot, actually. Um, we brought in, uh, we created a diversity board of um, faith leaders and leaders from um, di different diverse groups to help advise us on both the imagery that we used in our materials and the words that we used and had health literacy consultants help advise us to make sure that our patient information forms and all the information that we shared was appropriate. We also trained our clinical trial sites that historically had not been thinking through this in quite the same way. Many of vaccine centers around the United States um, actually run in a very efficient way but don't necessarily put diversity as the first thing they're thinking about. But the way people answer the telephone, the questions they asked over the phone, the way people were greeted as they walked into the center. Um, we brought in um, experts that we listened to very carefully, who then helped us train our sites to make sure that the entire experience for a clinical trial participant was as welcoming as possible and was tailored to suit their needs. And at the end of the day, I'm incredibly grateful to every single one of our 30,000 clinical trial participants who are the true heroes of the COVID um, vaccine development for um, taking the time to listen and learn and choose to participate. That's fantastic. Um, now over to you, Dr. Rees. Um, what do you think are some potential barriers researchers should consider when working to increase diversity in clinical trials in underrepresented and underserved communities. Thank you, Dr. Long. Thank you very much for, for uh, being our moderator this morning and for being a part of this, uh, this group. I'd like to uh, sort of for piggyback on a bit of what Dr. Everson said earlier, because I think it really speaks to the question that you asked in the, uh, just now. <clears throat> As you know, I'm, I'm at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, where it's a robust research enterprise, uh, heavily basic science. Um, about 15, 20% of it is clinical. But over the years, we have worked as to develop uh, a clinical trials workforce. We have a large international center for vaccine development where almost all the recent vaccines, whether it be Ebola or Zika or H1N1 or uh, of course, Corona, uh, we have participated in, in many respects, led in. The reason I'm mentioning this, and that is I think some of the barriers that we have experienced are not unique to us. They're really barriers in general. And I'll share with you what we have done over the years in an attempt to address these barriers and how it was helpful to us when we actually did the Moderna trial or the Pfizer trial or the Novavax trial and all the trials the major uh, vaccine trials that have been uh, now approved, we did. But I think it was, it was a bit of, of, of being fortunate uh, why we were able to accomplish this. So the two main barriers I can think of. One is the fact that there, <clears throat> there's a lack of research literacy often within the community in which we wish to uh, recruit patients from. And secondly, there's often a lack of ongoing or purposeful research literacy training. So it's, it's people remain research, uh, not, not literate, and there's no effort to train them until we need to have them participate. So over the past 25, 30 years, we've had a very 
robust program called Mini Medical School. And it's national, but ours have, we've used that vehicle as a specific way of educating the public. And we have over 300 community members who attend a five to six weeks course, three hours per night or per evening, once a week for five to six weeks. And these, these often are participants coming every year. A few years ago, I had a, a reunion and we're gonna give a little awards. And there are 35 persons who came 10 consecutive years. And there are many others who have missed a year or two, but th they became uh, sort of, uh, they consider themselves to be medical school graduates. And they get certificates as well. And I said, just make sure that you don't have a, a license to practice medicine. So, you know, there's a limit. But the point I'm trying to make is that they have, not only do we provide education on diabetes or hypertension, but we provide research education on what's an IRB, what, what's an informed consent, how patients are randomized, uh, how the, the, the investigators uh, are blinded to certain things. So we invest, we educate them over years, decades. And so as a consequence, when it was uh, COVID, we have to reach out to the community. They're used to it. Sometimes I've, I've, I've become very, very fond of this group once a year. And you'll have participants come to me and say, Dr. Reese, is there any trial that you have that could be a benefit to my mother who has cancer or who has asthma or who has this? So they have come to realize it's a special track. They believe they have a, a very special opportunity to get a specialized treatment. I'm going to give you one last uh, example, which I'm very proud of. The average oncology uh, minority participation nationwide is less than 5%. Because of our purposeful effort over decades, um, we have between 30 five to 40% participation. And so as part of our comprehensive cancer center designation, as some of that they've always complimented us for it as very unique. And we said it's not accidental, it's purposeful effort. It's likewise when we had to do the COVID uh, uh, trials, <clears throat> whether it be Moderna or Pfizer, for example, again, we had a population, both a, a minority population of various types, whether it be Latin uh, X or, or African-American or, or other minorities who have been nurtured. So I do believe that these are real barriers, barriers of concern, barriers of, of ignorance, barriers of, of unfamiliarity with certain things. But I think one has to use an effort of purposefully and intentional in our education of the public. I remember there when I was uh, in training in New York, there was, a, there was an advertisement that has studied, stayed in my mind. It was a department store called Sims. And that's a long time ago. I'm not even sure they're still in business or not. I just remember that. And it was an advertisement that says, an educated consumer is our best customer. And I've always remembered that. So to the extent that we wish to have the best participation in a diverse population, we need to educate, educate that consumer and they'll become our best customer. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree 1000%. I do wanna to touch on one um, small thing that you, well, not small thing, a quite a big topic, I think that's important here. Uh, and you touched on this a little bit in, in your response, but what role do you think community engagement has in addressing these barriers? And what are the strategies that you think are necessary for effective community engagement and research? Very important. Uh, again, <clears throat> that, if if your community engagement is simply whenever you need a study to sort of send out flyers and expect people to participate, that doesn't work. There has to be a, a again, purposeful. And let me say it in a different way. To the extent that you can involve the community with something that there is benefit short term, to say there'll be benefit in 10 years doesn't really work. And i give another example, in, in, a, in, a, in an urban population, hypertension is relatively commonplace. And unfortunately, uh, strokes are also a consequence of that. 
And so there was a, one, of her, one of her cardiologists developed the idea that, well, you know, would like to do a survey first and do a study. So what he did, he actually decided that the, his hypothesis was that uh, men were, were just ignoring their health status. And obviously they were silent hypertensive, uh, hypertension that was un un undiagnosed and thus not treated. So he went around and recruited a group of, of, of barbers, barber shops, and that actually would train all the barbers to become blood pressure, would be able to take blood pressure on a regular basis. And one group that was obviously the control, a usual care, they provide their usual care, and another group that were, were not. In a very short time, I recall traveling with the, with, with the mayor and went to two or three barber shops and how engaged the barbers were, that they were doing blood pressure cuff before they start cutting the hair. More importantly, they were excited that at least few of them, that they refused to do to cut hair and they had the person get out of the chair and go to the emergency room because the blood pressure was so high. So they believed that they, and they may really have, they've saved a life. And so as a consequence, the community engagement was truly engaging them in participating in the study and the outcome. And of course, that uh, Dr. Elijah Cummings got very famous, CNN, at a CNN award or so. But it really became a very, you know, everything is, everything is simple once you've heard it. It was a simple study, but it required an enormous amount of uh, brilliance to have thought of the approach, which now has saved lives. Yeah, I, I, and again, this is such an important topic, the, the role of community engagement um, and, and it being a, a priority throughout the development of, of research and, and, and those protocols, at least in, in my opinion. I do want to open up for this question for, for each of you to respond um, as we talk about community engagement, health literacy, and, and, and the roles that they play. What are methods researchers can apply today, so to speak, uh, to address the growing mistrust of medical research and clinical trials within the communities they serve? And whoever wants to jump in on that first, go ahead. So maybe I can start, uh, Dr. Long. So um, in the region where I sit, it's actually absolutely important that even before you go to the individual consent, you've got to consider a community consent, okay? Um, therefore, meaning that uh, your clinical trial community engagement does not just start with you going out and meeting various different individuals out there, but you do have to start with, uh, um, you know, some of the leaders within those particular communities to understand exactly what it is that, uh, you actually intend to do and all will benefit the community. And most of the time, it usually comes out that, um, um, especially those ones that, uh, you know, there isn't uh, equitable access to healthcare, uh, where health system strengthening is actually needed. Um, the engagement therefore, you know, becomes a discussion about um, which kind of access to laboratory services, for example, uh, is the community going to, you know, uh, benefit from even as the clinical trial is being done. And then eventually after the clinical trial, what are some of those things that, uh, you know, uh, will be seen or counted as capacity building uh, as, as, as this, uh, you know, clinical trial actually winds down. So therefore, um, uh, most of the clinical trial groups at the moment really have now prioritized uh, community engagement and are integrating it into the processes that they are doing before they actually go out and uh, uh, start a clinical trial. Way, way before. I mean, as soon as someone has got a protocol synopsis, uh, it's time to start engaging that community because it can take time. Back to you. I think, if, if, am I on? I, I think that. Um... There's, one is to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge that there is, there, there is hesitancy and there was in the early stages of COVID and we recognize that. But I do think that as uh, Dr. Moses said earlier, the engagement has to start early. It has to start before. And 
we, we believe it cannot be episodic. It cannot be a one-off. It has to be a consistent uh, education and involvement. Um, again, during COVID, we realized that there's going to be hesitancy. What can we do? So we decided we're going to have a, a, a large gathering, start with a webinar. We invited Dr. Tony Fauci and we invited four of the most respected pastors in the community. And, and uh, we invited the, the university president to be there and just make it into a big deal. There are over 2,000 people who attended and stayed on for, I don't know, it must have been close to two hours. So I do believe that if one is serious about uh, achieving these goals, it will take time but it has to be persistent and consistent. And I think after a while, the community will, will have a certain amount of trust and they'll be requesting information. In addition, we had some of the community leaders ask, could they be a site for vaccination? Could, because they said even where the university was, it's not accessible to some people. So maybe if you could have their facility be a site, and I thought that was, we really had arrived, so to, so to speak, where it was the other way around. The community leaders was, were actually establishing their own sites, whether it be a church site or the facilities to be, to be a, a, a vaccination site or a screening site or a testing site. And I thought that was, uh, I think that's the way to go, uh, to be very persistent. Yeah, I think Dr. Reese um, shares a, uh a wonderful experience that's come out of COVID-19, which is um, awareness. Um, Dr. Fauci was incredibly active. In, in fact, he came and spoke to all of our investigators um, very kindly and um, to sort of pass on the same message, which is this: it's essential we do this the right way. Uh, the study conducted in the wrong population isn't gonna help anybody. And we need to build trust. We need to do this right now. I mean, our, our investigators all completely understood. Many had um, community outreach programs, but many did not. And they've now been able to put those in place. Um, I think it's, but it's not just what we do, you know, as a result of COVID-19, it's how that continues. And I think it is very much beholden on companies and people who sponsor clinical trials to continue to say that this is incredibly important. Um, we can't just do it when it grabs headlines and when there is sort of news um, pressure for everybody to sort of understand this. We've all got to keep this at the top of our agendas. Um, and we think that's extremely important and look very carefully at the impact of diseases on different populations and are incredibly thoughtful in the way we design trials now um, to make sure that they represent the populations most impacted, whatever that may be. And I think, um, you know, Moderna is a very young company in the clinical trial space. As I said, our COVID-19 vaccine was the first phase three trial we had ever run. We're very fortunate in that we have been, a, many, many experts came and helped us um, sort of think this through um, because we were caught up in something so incredibly important as developing a COVID-19 vaccine. But we've chosen to continue that um, for all our programs. So every single clinical trial we now run, um, particularly in the phase two, phase three space, um, is very, very thoughtful in this regard. And we're very grateful to the experts who've really helped us put this together and think it through. Um, and that involves engaging with the community um, globally now as we expand out into many more countries. Um, and that brings a different set of challenges and complexities when your health literacy in one country, but you're now trying to translate that into 20 different languages and think that through globally. It, it's, um, it's something that the whole industry needs to get better at and think is incredibly important before we see true transformational change. You know, uh, Dr. Iverson, uh, you just answered a question I was about to ask you as well in terms of what the impact uh, the pandemic had on on uh, trial participation in communities and, and drug development. So I'm going to ask another question, um, and this one is going to be um, so. Thank you for thank you for your response. 
Um, I'm gonna ask another question, which, it, which I'm gonna address to each of you, um, or feel free to jump in, but what are, it, sort of piggybacking on, on what we're talking about, what are some ways science and medical researchers should address cultural competency when working with diverse communities, diverse patient communities? Each of you touched on this a bit, but I don't want to be a bad teacher and, and call on someone. <laughs> Moses? Yes. Yes, thanks. Thanks again, um, Dr. Long, for, for that one. Uh, so, of course, uh, cultural awareness becomes uh, absolutely important because the understanding of uh, various different communities of, about uh, various issues, um, culture needs to be taken into account. So for example, if you're doing um, a study or that is uh, going to touch on infertility, for example, and or fertility uh, in some low and middle income countries um, and your organization in one way or another has got a history of uh, you know, either being you know, a group that uh, is actually fighting for population control or something close to that, they'll, be, they'll definitely be issues um, that will need to be discussed. So therefore, it's absolutely important as much as possible to actually let the leaders within those particular, uh, you know, cultures, those particular communities to lead um, those kind of discussions for the simple reason that they will uh, probably say the same thing as what you will probably be saying, but in a way that the community absolutely understands. Uh, without uh, uh, you know, bringing about any kind of misrepresentation of facts or even misunderstanding exactly what it is that the clinical trial is all about. Uh, so therefore, um, we, we still insist and uh, push uh, within the Science for Africa Foundation that uh, the inclusion of groups uh, within communities, whether they are PIs or whether they are you know, experts that will be involved with development of protocols, uh, to be included, uh, you know, within these uh, global communities as early as possible. Um, there were definitely some kind of resistance, uh, you know, in some areas within the African continent against the vaccines uh, for COVID-19, for example. And I know it's prob it was probably the same uh, nearly all over the world. Um, but again, uh, if you just include that local voice, uh, you could probably move um, a little bit uh, quicker. That is, that is what I would say. So, for example, one of the interesting things that uh, we, we did recently during COVID-19 is that when WHO Glopida put out research priorities for the world for COVID-19, we took those and then, in a way, interrogated them and asked the question, are these the priorities for Africa? Are they right for Africa? And the interesting thing is that when we put out a survey, which was uh, replied by just about 1,200 people, well, well, scientists actually, more than just you know, lay people, uh, it was quite evident that uh, some of the research priorities that had been uh, you know, put by Global Health uh, fell off the priority list. And interestingly enough, there were some others that were added on, uh, probably 17 new research priorities that were, were added on because, for example, um, you know, comor comorbidities, uh, you know, COVID and TB, uh, COVID and HIV, you know, COVID and sickle cell, uh, which, you know, also um, uh, in a way, if uh, there's lack of oxygen or low oxygen, SpO2, uh, you know, you can you can guess what will happen to a sickler, uh, and yet some of these things were not included in the original you know priorities that were there uh, from from global health. Uh, so we still think that uh, um, uh, that uh, you know clinical trials, clinical trial capacity building, for example, uh, need to be as much as possible aligned with the disease burdens of the geographies where this particular research um, will be done. Uh, back to you, Dr. Long. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lobo. I, I think, you know, really 
sharing with the audience and all of us, you know, that that global perspective, which is so important. And when we're answering the question of cultural competency, of course, there's differences across regions and, and countries. So thanks for um, addressing that so uh, eloquently. Um, Dr. Reese or Dr. Iverson, would you like to, re to respond to that as well? well? I think Dr. Lobo made some very interesting points there. Um, and, you know, obviously has, um, that was fascinating to understand the, the perspective of a different continent on a global health proposal. And I think um, it is also something that the entire ecosystem needs to be thinking about as well, because um, when we are developing our programs, we look to global regulators to guide us on the acceptable clinical trial pathway and the data that they expect to see. And so we do need um, regulators to also understand the global perspective. So when a single regulator um, is looking at what will work in their country or their region, um, and yet you're trying to develop a vaccine or a therapeutic that can be available globally. That is also something I think that needs to be um, discussed at that level of how we develop programs for global approval to make our vaccines and therapeutics available to all. Um, and I, I think that you know, we are starting to see many of the global regulators have positions on diversity in clinical trials as being a critical part of what they would expect to see when we come with data. And I think that's incredibly encouraging as well, that they are aware that this is important, um, you know, as part of the sort of the global perspective. What I would want to add that long to what both Dr. Loba and Dr. Iverson said, and that is uh, cultural commerce is a two-way street. On the one hand, you want to make sure that the, the providers, the clinicians, also have a um, have great sensitivity to cultural variations and cultural sensitivity. Um, one of the things that I do like uh, is the fact that the licensing body for medical schools across the United States does now include uh, a, a, an element, I'm trying to recall the name of the element, it's called, um, um, it's a community emphasis. I forgot the exact name there, but it really requires there to be a, a, a module, a training module where students are exposed to the community. Now, <clears throat> it could be crafted in different ways. But the, what we have done, Marilyn, we try to make sure that we use that as an opportunity to expose the or student body as a whole to cultural diversity within the community. They will become the doctors of tomorrow. And, and having been exposed and trained as a requirement for all students. So when they become physicians, practicing physicians, they would have at least had the basis of the cultural diversity and they would have, would have learned what cultural competence is like and thereby apply the appropriate level of inclusiveness in, in, their, in their trials. So on the one hand, we do want to uh, include our, our, our communities of color, but on the other hand, we want to make sure that the providers are also attuned to the fact that this is critical to the, the uh, transferability of data across ethnic, racial, geographic uh, boundaries. And it, it is not just a fad, it's a real scientific basis for doing so. You know, I'll, I'll, to touch a little bit more on, on that, um, we mentioned this a bit in, in prioritizing the workforce and, and the community around um, uh, the university. You know, what are some priorities, let's say top three, you are finding in clinical trial diversity that are being addressed within the academic and university community? Anybody else, or what's that? Uh, I said I, I I'm happy to, but I want to defer to my colleagues. Sure. Any thoughts there? So just to clarify, you want top three priorities with the academic environment? I, I might That's not right. be the best to to respond yes, to that one. Yes. 
So, so this this question is directed to, to you, Doctor Doctor E, specifically. Um, oh, you had okay. talked uh, you had talked about um, the workforce and, and, and training and development and, and some of your earlier remarks. So, just thinking of of where we are today, what are some of the top? I would say three priorities you are finding in clinical trial diversity that are being addressed within the academic and university community. Sure. Thank you. I do believe that academic medicine has has a significant responsibility to to introduce strategies, approaches, models that can be used wholesale. Um, so that's the first. I do think that's the first thing. Number two, one could one could do that by creating a an internal culture, um, a culture of equity. Uh, we have uh, several years ago we introduced what we call a culture transformation initiative that was focused on equity in compensation, starting out that way, making sure women and men are paid the same for the same job. Equity in promotion, make sure women and men are promoted around the same levels. Right. Equity in opportunities, equity in recruitment. The reason, the point I'm trying to make is that you set the tone that there is a an interest in seeing equity and diversity. So when you shift it, as it were, it's not really a bait and switch, but you shift it or extend it to research and see equity and diversity in research, it is not new. It is just part of the, the culture. This is the other the point I want to make, and that is <clears throat> I do believe that universities have, have that responsibility in setting a priority of priorities for coming up with strategies, approaches, and models that can be applied wholesale. Let me give an example of one. So um, s several years ago, the, the governor of Maryland and the legislature became very interested in how they could address health disparities because it's, it's expensive and it's, it's cost lives and cost wellness and so on. And they wanted to, they came to the universities, both Johns Hopkins and Maryland and say, how could we, how could you work together to make a difference? Well, I was privileged to serve as the chair of that group and we met for months. Some of us, it's not our area, but we thought, even though it's not our research area, it's our responsibility. And after many months of working, we decided to come up with a, not a rocket science idea, but one that was borrowed from um, the Harlem zones. And we created the health enterprise zones, where what we do know is that when, when, uh, communities are, have low health services or agencies and low social agencies and services, there's a higher rate of morbidity, mortality, disability, uh, emergency visits, and costly. So, if, so we proposed through that model uh, the creation of what we call HEZs. And this is, again, Hopkins in Maryland taking the, the responsibility. We're not going to be implementing it. That is not our role. We're there to come up with a workable hypothesis and a model that if in fact the state would actually use tax credits or tax incentives or loan forgiveness or, or lower rent, particularly for practitioners, physicians, dentists, other practitioners to move into those zip codes, health enterprise zones that are low in those services, we hypothesize that if indeed the depletion of those services was associated with the increase in morbidity and mortality, then let's replete those services. And we was presented to the legislature that approved it as a model and granted $16 million for the state to set up health enterprise zones across the state of Maryland. The university's role ended, but the implementation was carried out by the state health departments. So I do believe that that is something that universities have to take seriously. It is a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a health disparity. It's a costly uh, uh, problem and one that in fact we can make a difference in, but it, it does require universities to recognizing that we have a role to play either jointly at each university or collectively or collaboratively but I think that that is something that we could do or we should be doing, not just with uh, health disparity, but other forms of, of 
of, of health-related disorders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I, I do want to ask uh, one more question. I think we have time for one more question, and this will be posed for each of you to, to respond. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, or what I, what I hear um, in some of the uh, responses is, you know, how do we hold um, organizations accountable, right? So how can policymakers hold researchers accountable for sustaining and implementing protocols that require more diversity in, in clinical trials? And that is open to whoever wants to jump in. So why don't I jump in on that one, Dr. Long? I think it's an excellent question. I'm really glad you asked it. And I, I alluded a little bit earlier. I think it's the entire ecosystem needs to be involved in this. Um, this became incredibly important in the development of COVID-19 vaccine where uh, regulators were talking to us during the conduct of that clinical trial, asking us about the diversity of the population in our study. They knew it was critically important for the world that those trials were conducted in diverse populations across uh, many elements of diversity, age, gender, race, ethnicity, comorbidity, um, that, that it can be a very broad uh, definition. Um, and we've seen uh, several come out with, with sort of a, a legislation around this topic, um, but I think it should be the expectation I think um, we, as uh, an industry, need to hold ourselves to a very high standard. The sponsors of all clinical trials, whether that is an industry or an academic sponsor, needs to declare upfront what the intent is. Um, and it should be thoughtful and around the impact of uh, the disease on, on different populations and should be thoughtfully put together um, and explained upfront. And I think when we start holding ourselves to these very high standards, um, and the entire ecosystem will see what we are doing. I think it will help enormously. Um, but I, I think that should be the expectation of regulators, clinical trialists, academics, sponsors, the entire ecosystem to get involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There isn't anyone named involved. Care to respond to that as well? Yeah, maybe I could. Uh... I could go. So thanks again for that uh, important question, uh, Dr. Long, that uh, it's absolutely important for there to be a policy push on the other, on the, on the one hand. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also important for groups to actually recognize that it's important to have patient-centered approaches when we are designing our clinical trials. Uh, because if the two meet together, then the recipe for success will be there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, of course, we'll continue with this uh, um, sort of like run of the mill clinical trials that do not have much of an impact. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely important that we meet uh, halfway like that. And I absolutely agree with uh, Dr. Iverson that um, there is some high level importance for us to consider creation of an ecosystem rather than a silo. And uh, it's uh, absolutely, you know, again, to just underline that word important, that uh, uh, we allow, uh, you know, uh, PIs within uh, low and middle income countries, for example, participating in global trials to integrate. And, and this is where policymakers will be happy with you as a clinical trialist. If you allow the PI, to integrate the clinical trial into uh, you know, the health system of care to the extent that you know, there is perfusion of whatever the clinical trialist is doing with whatever is actually going to be available to uh, you know, other patients or all patients or you know, uh, however they will see uh, fit um, for, for this to, to actually uh, occur. So therefore, um, it's just important for continued uh, participation of local expertise with a strong international collaboration. And then as much as possible, work with uh, you know, all kinds of centers. So for example, all the way from national level centers of excellence uh, to you know, uh, rural communities or groups that are seated within demographic surveillance sites in rural communities anywhere, for example, on the African continent. 
So just an integration of uh, all that would get the policymakers interested in what you're doing. Uh, otherwise, uh, they just see it as uh, you know another data collection exercise um, for you know any any other disease that has been done in the past. Uh, but just to finish it off, uh, an interest or uh, a focus on disease burden of the local communities will also get you you know mileage with policymakers. Uh, back to you, Doctor. Thank you, I agree with that. We're right at time, but Dr. Reese, I wanna give you a moment to quick response or you're all set. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I think that what, what both Dr. Loba and Dr. Everson said, I fully agree with. I thought they were, they were perfect and I really have nothing more to add except to endorse what they have said. Yes, thank you for that. And uh, you, you sort of teed up my question talking about uh, Maryland legislature and that work that, uh, that's going on there. So thank you very much for that. Well, this was a great dis discussion on an important topic and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. And I add my thanks to the panel. Uh, terrific discussion.